Today we'll be discussing redlining, how it came to be, what it is, and how it continues to impact family wealth, public schools, and the health of Daytonians. This video was inspired by the We Redlining exhibit at the main branch of the Dayton Public Library. Check the link in the description to see how your community can use this project. With its waterways and rich resources, it's easy to see why the city of Dayton grew where it did. The Great Miami River divided Dayton into west and east. Ohio entered the Union as a free state, but that did not mean Ohioans were ready for racial equality. A series of black laws made it difficult for African Americans to settle in the state, and those who could were denied access to public education, the ballot box, and running for elected office. In fact, only the lowest skilled, least paying jobs could be held by African Americans. Since the Industrial Revolution, workers have migrated to cities in search of good-paying jobs in manufacturing. In Dayton, companies like Barney and Smith Car and Dayton Malleable Iron attracted immigrant workers to Dayton's west side. The Wright Brothers family home at 7 Hawthorne Street stood in Dayton's west side. When internationally acclaimed poet Paul Lawrence Dunbar set out to purchase a home for his mother, he bought a few blocks away from the famous aviator's boyhood home. After the success of the airplane, the brothers bought land in the nearby suburb of Oakwood and constructed a mansion. Slowly, West Dayton became home to fewer and fewer native-born Euro-Americans. The area became home to more immigrant and African Americans not afraid to work hard for their piece of the American dream. However, downtown businesses weren't eager to have African Americans as patrons in their establishments. This led to more African Americans spending more of their time and money in West Dayton. Near the beginning of the 20th century, the African American population grew significantly in Dayton as families once living in the South moved north looking for a better life than the South provided. During World War I with immigration restrictions, Dayton Industries required additional employees to manage the government's war-fighting needs. Those needs were met by African-American workers. After the 1929 economic collapse, one in five Americans were out of work. Among African Americans, it was one in four. FDR ran on a platform to pull the nation back into prosperity. As we've discussed before on this channel, most Americans supported the programs that came from the New Deal, and those still in place, such as Social Security, remain popular. In 1934, American legislators passed the National Housing Act, which made 20 and later 30-year mortgages and low interest rates a thing. Prior to this, to buy a home, people typically had to put down more than 50% and pay the remaining balance off in five years. The FHA's extended payment program made home ownership accessible to more Americans, largely leading to expanding what we recognize as the middle class. The Homeowners Loan Corporation, known today as the Federal Housing Administration, set out to determine the risk for mortgage default. Like a good government agency, it drafted a manual. This manual required segregation. It also drew up color-coded maps called residential security maps. These are the maps that give us the term redlining. At first glance, they might be confused with Sanborn maps, but they are very, very different. Green indicated the best areas occupied by the best people, such as Euro-American businessmen. The FHA manual required restrictive racial covenants, language written into a property's deed or plat agreement prohibiting sale or occupancy by African Americans to have already been in place for a green designation. In 1910, neighboring Oakwood had these restrictive covenants. Blue areas were desirable, where white-collared, predominantly Euro-Americans lived. Yellow said the neighborhood was in decline, mostly home to working class families. Finally, red meant the area had detrimental influences, such as foreign born people, poor white people, and African Americans. The higher the percentage of black and brown people in the area, the more likely the site was given a D or red designation. These maps, as Kevin Ehrman Solberg of Mapping Prejudice pointed out, linked race with space and desirability. Studies have shown that those who lived in red areas weren't more likely to default on their loans. But living in these areas meant access to the federal program was much more difficult. Without access to federally funded programs, these sites continued to decline. In addition to landlords abandoning properties, 
cities cut services such as transportation, resulting in property values dropping and crime increasing. Meanwhile, those living in blue and yellow areas had more mobility. African Americans and other people of color were unable to leave the city, unlike their Euro-American peers who could use the equity they had in their home or the assistance of the government home loan program, many people of color were still denied access even if they had the capital to purchase in the suburbs. Many new neighborhoods and developments were kept white with the same restrictive covenants the FHA had required of older, established areas to be color-coded green. By 1940, 80% of Dayton's African-American population lived in West Dayton. Why were Euro-Americans against integration? Money. There apparently was a real genuine fear that had gripped the neighborhood. And at what do you time, think they were afraid of? Did they tell you? It was primarily their property values. This is the thing. And, and the uh, one group, uh, one person who was particularly uh, concerned, said that they had been told that their property would drop $6,000. Among 90 real estate brokers interviewed in Chicago, three-fourths believed that entry of non-whites into a neighborhood damaged property values. The evidence from a variety of sources indicates that this proportion is approximately the same among real estate men uh, in all cities. One realtor told me that uh, property values declined permanently, about 25% in the case of Negroes, somewhat less for uh, Orientals. Another realtor uh, said that when Negroes move into a block, adjoining properties uh, go down in value from 1000 to $2,000. In 1968, Congress passed the Fair Housing Act. The law aimed to protect people from discrimination based on race, religion, or national origin, but did nothing to mend the damage to neighborhoods over the previous 30 years. Today, the law is rarely enforced. As a result, we can still see housing segregation and its effects in Dayton. Home ownership is the number one way Americans create wealth. The program the American government implemented disproportionately assisted Euro-Americans in getting a foot on the home ownership ladder because African Americans were denied proportional access to these same programs. For almost 30 years, 98% of HAA loans went to Euro-American borrowers. Even when receiving better education and earning more money than their Euro-American peers, African Americans could not secure land ownership and generate the same wealth as Euro-Americans. It remains true across America, but particularly in Dayton, it is more difficult for an African American to get a loan than a Euro-American. According to Kate Weedle at the Dayton Daily News, quote, Dayton is one of 61 metro areas in the U.S. where minorities are denied mortgage loans at higher rates than their white counterparts, a modern-day system of redlining that keeps minority neighborhoods from recovery, end quote. When they do, nationally, African Americans often pay higher interest rates and higher insurance premiums while living in homes consistently valued 25% lower than similar homes in predominantly Euro-American neighborhoods. Ownership of property values impact public education because the primary way schools are funded is through local property taxes. Higher home values generate more tax revenue for local schools. Schools in areas with high-value homes have larger budgets than schools in areas with homes of lesser value. School districts and even their grades are often part of a real estate listing. Research has shown a school's location is a better predictor of education and economic outcomes than how hard a student studies. But it has long been common knowledge that access to a good education is the first step to socioeconomic advancement in America. Across the country, city planning and development have consistently favored wealthier Euro-American neighborhoods. West Dayton is a food desert, a place where full grocery stores with fresh food are far from homes and more challenging to get to because of a lack of public transportation. In April of 2019, one of the area's last full grocery stores closed. Without loans, homeowners cannot pay for renovations, leaving hazards like toxic paint, asbestos, and lead plumbing in place decades after the healthcare community and government recognize the negative health implications. These environmental factors mean people of color have higher rates of asthma, heart disease, and certain types of cancer than their Euro-American peers. What can we do? Let me know in the comments what you think you can do to make a difference in your community. 
In May of 2021, West Dayton saw the grand opening of the Gem City Market, a co-op grocery store. Supporters say that it's likely one of the country's only worker and community-owned full-service grocery stores. 19,000 residents live within a mile and a half of the store. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. That tells the YouTube algorithm to push it out to people enjoying similar content. And here are two other videos I think you will enjoy.